Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar on five axis simultaneous machining. And today's webinar will be given by our five axis expert, uh, Ahmad Onkar. But before we start the webinar, there's some announcements I would like to uh, uh, mention to you. Uh, first, uh, next week, uh, we're having there's SolidWorks World in Los Angeles, SolidWorks, 2000, uh, SolidWorks World 2018. And uh, we'd like to invite everyone who's going to visit us in our booth, booth 407. And uh, Emil Somich, Dr. Emil Somich and myself will be uh, at the event as well as the USA team. So we're all looking forward to seeing you there when you get to SolidWorks World. Uh, the second announcement that I want to remind everybody about is the Solid Cam World, which will be in May of 28th, uh, at 28th through the 30th uh, in Tut uh, Tutlingen, uh, Germany. Uh, we have a very exciting agenda uh, set up for us. Uh, so if you have not registered, you can go to our website and register in the um, reseller area. There's a place to register. And uh, we're hoping to see as many of you as possible. It will be really, really exciting. We have a full schedule already set up. Uh, so don't forget to register for it. Uh, okay, uh, I'm, I will make you now the um, presenter. And you can unmute yourself and uh, start. Thank you very much, Sydney. Uh, welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, today's webinar is uh, is more of a training kind of a webinar rather than uh, showing you something new or something uh, uh, new with a version or something like that. It's it's more to do with the functionalities of five axis, how they work, and uh, we have divided this webinar into actually three webinars because it's very difficult to cover everything in one webinar. It will become pretty lengthy and uh, it'll become boring after some time if it becomes too lengthy. So we have split it into three webinars. The first one will cater to the generic five axis uh, functionality that we have in Solid Cam. The second one will spill over some portion of the generic five axis capability and move into uh, the application based uh, functionalities of Solid Cam's five axis. And the last webinar will again focus on some mesh-based functionalities of Solid Cam 5 Axis. So that's how we have structured this uh, whole webinar for you in three different stages. This webinar's concept of 5 Axis basically came after us. We started getting a lot of queries on how this functionality works, how does this feature work, how does this function work inside Solid Cam. So we thought that it's better that we create a short and a crisp uh, training uh, kind of a guide for five axis. Although I know from my personal experience that when you would like to learn five axis, it's a pretty lengthy process. And uh, trust me, it takes time, but it's pretty exciting. Okay. So when we talk of multi-axis, we, we basically talk of several things in it. There are positional types of machining and then there is simultaneous machining. In the type of multi-axis machining, you can have four axis positional, which is three continuous and one rotary, which is locked and which can only go in increments. Then you have four axis simultaneous where you have X, Y, Z and either A or B axis rotating along with the XYZ motions. And then you have five axis positional, which is basically three plus two, the most common functionality or the most common process used by many machining shops worldwide is three plus two, wherein you have three continuous axis, XYZ, and then there are two rotary and swivel axis, one rotary and one swivel axis, which are locked at a particular angle. They can only move in increments. 
And finally, we have five axes simultaneous where we have got all the five axes moving together to generate a motion. And this is generally used for machining several paths. For example, this is used for machining impellers, blisks, board, or it could be used for machining uh, aerostructure parts. It is also used for machining parts, which could have been done in simple three axis, but needed five axis because the depth of the particular feature is so much that you cannot use long tools. You will have to use short tools, tilt the head and keep machining the area. So five axis simultaneous actually has too many, uh, the breadth of application of five axis simultaneous is vast. You could probably do anything in five axis simultaneous. Let's come to the axis definitions. Although these are not, I would say, a hard and fast uh, rule, but the theoretical uh, explanation for each of these axes is fixed. It's up to the machine tool vendor if he wants to change the names of these axes. For example, rotation axis around X always is called A axis. There are some machine tool manufacturers that they name this axis is B axis internally inside their control. But that's a different story. Rotation around Y is always called B axis, and rotation around Z is C axis. So these are the three possibilities in our rotary axis or swivel axis. There is no other axis like D, E, and F, so it's just these three letters. In the machines, you can broadly classify into three types. You can have both the rotary and the swivel movement on the head, and it will be called as a head-head motion machine. Or you could have the swivel on the head and the rotary on the table. It could be called as a head-table machine. Or you could have both the rotary and swivel on the table, and it will be called a table-table machine. Then Fourth type, which is not popular, but you will see it in several exhibitions and in academic colleges. It's, it's a very nice concept and it's called as a hexapod, where you have six linear or uh, six ball screws, and those six ball screws control your rotary and linear axis. So there is everything is fixed. Only the ball screws, the six ball screws are moving. That's why the name hexapod. So this would, this is how a head-head type of machine looks like, where you have both the rotary and the uh, swivel on the head. Your bed can or may not be stationary, it can move, or generally head-head machines are pretty large machines, where you want to machine prototypes, you want to machine extremely large parts, where you would like to keep the bed stationary and the head moves in all directions. And another uh, type is the head table type, where you can have one rotary on the table and one swivel on the head. Again, a very common uh, concept, if you look at the DMG uh, machines, this kind of machines are pretty common with them. The application here could be machining of blisks or impellers or turbine blades. These uh, things, they, when, when they need clamping on both directions, this kind of machines are used or they come in pretty handy. Another concept of head table type machine where you have again the swivel on the head and the rotary on the bed. And the most common type is the table table construction there. You can have pretty small machines with the table table construction. They're very uh, uh, cost effective when you compare it with the head table or head head type of machines. Table table machines are pretty uh, cost effective. They are easy to handle and work with. And most important, they're very easy to understand for operators as well as for programmers. Okay, so when a program is given for a table table type of machine, it is very easy to that to uh, to understand how the motions are going to go. Okay, so this is the most common type of machine used worldwide. That's the table table type machine where you have both the rotary and the swivel on the 
bed. This is a concept of hexapod where you have got six ball screws, everything attached to the, uh, to the head, all the motions on the head. However, there is no linear motions happening because all those linear motions are being handled by this hexa or these six ball screws. They generate all the linear and the rotary and swivel axis in one go. This is still an academic concept. It's not yet fully uh, used um, in, in the industry, although in several exhibitions I did see them being exhibited, but then the, uh, the most important limitation here is the size of the machine. The machine really becomes huge and the part that can be actually cut on this machine becomes small. So the economics is not viable for such a machine. That's why it has still remained in the, in the academic area and not yet come into the full production environment. So these are the typical type of machines that work or we work with in with solid cam or even the world works with in five axis. Okay. Now, when we have table table type of machines and when we have uh, head head type or head table type, the most crucial thing that comes in in, uh, in terms of programmers is that how are they going to handle the rotating point when it's tilted, okay? This is very crucial for the programmers because they need to output two machines which cannot understand this tilting mechanism because we call such machines dumb machines. They really don't understand what they're doing. It they have to be fed. Now these are typically old machines or machines that do not have a, a, a function called RTCP or rotating tool center point function built into their control. Most modern day controls are having this function. Still, there will be some lower end controls of the same configuration where this option is not given. So you need, as a programmer, you need to understand this particular concept of RTCP and provide an output to these dumb machines so that they can move in the, the tool according to what you have output and given to the machine. Now, there are two possibilities. For a table table machine, it could be a rotating tool center point, or even for a head head type machine, it could be a RTCP point. For a table table machine and also for a head table machine, they get slightly complex when you have the machine zero rotary position. Okay, so we are going to look at some of the functionalities of uh, RTCP. What is basically an RTCP? Okay, now to understand what RTCP is, we need to first understand the, 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 the mathematics of or the terms used to define an RTCP machine. Now, let's assume the machine is a dumb machine. It doesn't understand anything. For example, if you want to tilt this tool, okay, I'm going to show you an animation after this. What happens on dumb machines and what happens on an RTCP machine? Okay, let's assume that we have a dumb machine which doesn't understand what RTCP is. And I want to rotate the head 45 degrees. If I have to rotate the head, the head would be rotated from the pivot point here. Okay, if it was a, it's a non-RTCP machine, all my linear axis will remain stationary. They won't move at all. Nothing will move. Only the head will tilt 45 degrees. That's what that's what we call as a dumb machine because it just rotates. If it was an RTCP machine, just assume that this point of the tool is stuck. It's welded to a, a point on the workpiece. And now you would like to rotate 45 degrees. What will happen? You want to keep that particular point on the tool constant without it moving even a micron and you would like now to rotate your head 45 degrees what will happen your x has to move along with the head your z has to move because as it moves up the tool is going to travel up but now the tool is going to be sticking to the workpiece in order to keep that workpiece constant the head has to move down in z Okay, so you have two motions, X and Z, also involved when you're moving 45 degrees.
Now, if the machine is dumb, it will not understand how much it needs to move in X and how much it needs to move in Z to achieve that 45 degrees without moving the tip of the tool anywhere else. These two values, the X and Z values, are something that this software needs to output to the machine. And how does it output? To output that machine, it needs to understand, first of all, what is the pivot, that is, what is the pivot distance? The pivot distance here is the distance from the base of the spindle face to the pivot point. That's one value here, it, which is fixed. There is a variable value here, which is the gauge length of the tool. Okay. So in our case, let's say the gauge length is 4 inch and the pivot distance is 12 inch. So the RTCP distance here is going to be 16. From solid cams perspective, this portion, the pivot is going to be inside the VMID file, whereas the gauge length is going to come from the software inside. So we will, we will send to the GPP a, a value equal to the G, gauge length, and GPP will then calculate First of all, what is going to be the X movement? What is going to be the Z movement? And how much is going to be tilted? So there are three values that are going to go from the uh, from the GPP. Okay. Now, if you are working with the new generation machines, you really don't have to worry about all that. How much is my X going to move? How much is my Z going to move? All you need to output is the code just before you begin your first position okay but in some machines you need to out you need to go to the position and then output the code okay it depends on how the machine behaves so the codes are different for different controls and I have listed down the codes for the most common controls that are there today in the market for example in Heidenheim if I want to switch on the RCP the code is M128 and if I want to switch it off at the end of the program, it is M129. In Siemens, it is Trauri. That is, it will switch on the RDCP, and the Trauf will switch off the RDCP. In Funnel, or in Mitsubishi, or in Mazak, it is G43.4. There's a new function now Funnel has introduced, and that is G43.5, which basically will uh, will uh, do the same thing, but instead of giving it angles, we need to give vectors to the control. G43.4 works with angles, 43.5 works with vectors, IJK vectors. And to switch off in funnel plane, the regular funnel control, G40 to switch it off. Okay. Sorry, I just need to show you that movie which missed. Which is surprising, should have not missed. here unfortunately it's hidden so I have this machine this is a head table type machine and I'm going you're going to see both the motions the first motion that is going to happen is rotary the angle is going to tilt the machine doesn't support RTCP the second the angle tilts but the machine supports RTCP That's without RTCP. I just want to move 90 degrees or 45 degrees. It just stays there. This is with RTCP. You can see that both X and Z motions are moving. That's it. That's how it, an RTCP machine would work. You can see that. Uh, Amod, you, we don't hear you at this moment. Sorry? We didn't hear you for for the last uh, 20 seconds. Can you repeat, please? Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, I'll just start again. Basically, what you're going to see on the machine, on, on this video, is that you will, uh, the first part of the axis movements, the machine is not supporting RTCP. So if I want to rotate it 90 degrees, the head will simply turn 90 degrees and stay there. But if the same motion was to, to be run on a machine that supported RTCP, you will see that 
to move 90 degrees or 45 degrees, the machine also makes some linear movements so that the tip of the tool is kept constant without moving even a micron here and there. Okay, that's without RTCP. And that's with RTCP. Notice the tip of the tool, it's constant. To keep it constant, it needs to move the linear axis. And the same is happening when it's rotating, it needs to move along with the rotary axis. So that is a basic difference between a machine that supports RTCP and a machine that doesn't support RTCP. For the machines that don't support RTCP, the post-processor becomes very crucial here. Okay. Right. <clears throat> Let's move into our uh, main subject today, and that is simultaneous five axis. So what we have today in our agenda is explaining the strategies, explaining the tool axis control, collision control, links, and we will later on in the second part of our webinar, we'll take up some specific examples for uh, application-based uh, five axis machine. We are of course not going to do any machine building for the simulation because this is part of our training. So I'm not going to be concentrating on the machine building for simulation, but we are going to be concentrating on the first four points. Strategies, tool axis control, collision, and links. The images are a bit old, but don't worry, the concept still is still the same. So the main strategies are parallel cuts. Basically, it could be parallel to X, parallel to Y, parallel to Z. Cuts along the curve, or if I've defined a curve, the cuts will be normal to that particular curve. Morph between two curves, parallel to a curve, project or projection, morph between two surfaces and parallel to surface. So these are the main strategies inside our generic five axis engine. Depending on the part, depending on the situation, you could use one of them. Okay, so we are going to see each of them <clears throat> and also some examples of where this could have been applied. I've been asked many times, how do we work in five axis, especially people graduating from three axis to five axis, they find it, they find this concept a bit weird because they are, they have used, they've been used to defining a part They've been used to defining the tool, the depth of cut, sidestep, and they are used to seeing a tool path. <clears throat> Unfortunately, five axis still doesn't work that way, although there are some areas that have uh, started getting automated, but those are specific areas of five axis. But for regular or generic five axis, things don't work like they work in, th in three axis. It's, it's not that you have what, two additional axes, so it should be slightly difficult than three axes. No, it's completely different. So how do we flow? How do the workflow go? First, we define what strategy we'd like to apply to that particular group of surface or a surface, single surface. Once you have defined, once you have set what strategy you would like to apply, you select the surfaces, you apply the strategy, you pick the tool, you pick the side step, and just calculate the tool path. Obviously, this tool path is not going to be the last tool path, or this is not going to be the final. Looking at the tool path and the group of surfaces that, that are there, you could then decide what kind of a tool axis control I need here to be applied to this particular uh, group of surfaces. So the next function immediately is the tool axis control. Ideally speaking, to get a best and smooth tool path in a five axis, your tool path should finish at point number two, or maybe at the most you apply point number four. Okay? Collision control comes only when you are unable to 
fixed certain area and the tool is still colliding against or gouging against a surface or it's colliding against a group of surfaces. In, in an ideal situation, I would never use collision control. That would be my last result. I would try to work with the tool axis control more to avoid the collision control because collision control with it making the tool path safe brings with it host of other things that actually make the tool path not smooth okay because then it needs to do a lot of adjustments to avoid the surface uh, so in the end the end result is that this tool path doesn't really get smooth so if you ask me my last resort is collision control if nothing works we then apply collision control but if your tool access control is good, I'll tell you that you really don't need to apply any collision control. You'll still get a much better tool path without any collisions. And then there's the links. So your flow of, of five axis tool path generation should look something like this. Although I will say that it's not a hard and fast rule, but this is what I have experienced for the last several years that I have been working with five axis. The most important point, sorry. The most important point here is to understand how five axis in SolidCAM works. Many a times you see that the toolpath is actually going out of the path. And you come back to your support or you come back to me and ask, why is this toolpath going out of the path when I don't want to machine anything out of the path? It looks like it's cutting air. Actually, it's not cutting air. That is because the tool path in five axis is represented by the tip of the tool. But what is important to us is the contact point. The tip may be out of the part, but the contact point of the tool will be somewhere else. The proportion of the tool that is in contact with the material of the part will be somewhere else. And we work with that particular contact point principle or the point where the tool touches the material, okay? And the tool path, the graphical tool path that you see is what we also call as the CL point or the point that is represented by the coordinates of the machine program. That means you will always see the G code representing this point, whereas the actual cutting is happening here. So we are working with the contact point, whereas the machine is being fed with the cutter location. Point. And the angles are determined by the IJK vector or the vector direction in X, Y, and Z. So this, in short, is how 5 axis works. So we have parallel cuts where, let's see the first image where we have uh, the X, Y angle 0 and the Z axis angle 0 that is going to go parallel to X or Y axis. Or you could provide an angle to the in, in the XY plane and the tool will or the tool paths cuts will be at an angle. Or you could have a constant Z kind of a tool path where you can provide a particular angle in Z, or you could just say I want a constant Z and you will get the cuts constant with the um, which are uh, parallel to the Z axis or perpendicular, sorry, normal to Z axis. Perpendicular to curve, I can just define a curve on, on, on a part and the cuts will be parallel, perpendicular to that curve. Now the step over that you define, one, two, three millimeters, are always going to be measured at the intersection of the cuts with the curve. Okay, Your two millimeter or one millimeter will be measured here and not here and here. It will be exactly at the place where the cuts are intersecting the curve. And then you have morph between two boundary curves where you can define two curves and the tool path will be morphed. Okay, It'll, the pattern will be created between uh, between these two curves. I see that we have some hand, somebody has raised a hand. Oh, I can't see it. Uh, questions I'll take a bit later because I'll lose the rhythm. 
Then you have parallel to curve, where you can define a set of surfaces and a guide curve, and the tool will, or the cuts will be created parallel to the curve. Something like what you see on your screen in the moment. And then you have projection, which is basically used for engraving or even doing chamfering in five axis. You pick an edge and you pick a group of surface, and you want the tool to follow the edge. Okay. Now you can have the curve either resting on the surface that you want to cut, or you could have it at a distance. What you only need to provide the solid can is if it's resting on the surface, you could leave the values of projection its default. But if it's not, then you need to provide the projection distance based on which it will generate the tool path. Then you have to mark between two surfaces. A classic example before we had multi-blade machining is to machine the floor of an impeller using the mark between two surfaces where you have flank one, flank two, and the drive surfaces, which is the bottom. Okay. And then you have parallel to surface where you can define a, a, a drive surface, which could be the flank of an impeller, and the edge surface could be the bottom surface. And the tool cut or the cuts will be created parallel to the bottom surface till it cannot create any cuts anymore on the drive surface. Let's come to tool axis control. And here, because what you saw before also holds good for HSS. But the difference between HSS and SEM5 axis is the tool axis control. And we have got several possibilities in, in tool axis control. I may not be able to show you everything, but I would like to show you the most important uh, tool axis controls that you will encounter and you will use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay? And then as the gout check, the purpose is, first of all, to avoid gouges of the tool into the part. The second and the most interesting purpose of gout check is actually to machine the part. Okay, we are going to come to some examples where I'm going to show you how gout check actually helps us to machine a part which could not be actually be machined in some other method, especially when the surfaces are really bad. You, you cannot do uh, any machining and that's when you use the gout check principle to create tool path on such bad surfaces. So again, in gout check, there are several options. I may not again be able to show you everything because it's pretty vast. But I'll show you the most important ones and the most common ones that you're going to use in your uh, routine five axis machining. Okay, let's go into our uh, software. And let's open some parts. I would like to tell you something. And this was like a, a 10 year old story where we had gone to uh, uh, attend a five axis training. The training was for six days. It was in Germany and it was between Monday and Saturday. We had a training session start on Monday, and it was the first time I was looking at this interface of five axis. And the trainer tried to teach us five axis on Monday, on Tuesday, and at the end of the second day, we all were actually looking at each other's faces and trying to understand what is this functionality. We are not able to understand even one single thing that was being explained. And that was because it was too technical and it was taken on parts that, was, that were very difficult to comprehend. And then we raised a, a query to the owner of the, the company that was giving us this training or supplying us the software, saying that, SOS, we need your help. He was going to go on a vacation and uh, he canceled his vacation and joined us on a Wednesday morning. And I would like to actually take that part that he started off with. And trust me, in two days, we got hang of what 5-axis is all about. He used a very simple cylinder, 
to explain us the concepts of five axis or to explain us how five axis works in in the software okay and i would like to use the same thing to explain to you the basics of five axis all right so i'm going to delete this i don't need it i'm going to start up uh, again uh, i believe there are some questions sydney can i take some questions sure go ahead uh, okay Arun has raised his hand. Arun, I can have you later. There are some. Uh... Okay, the audio was bad. I think that is fixed. Um, it's more to do with the audio itself. I think that's fixed. Okay. So. I'm going to start off with this part, trying to explain to you how 5-axis works. Okay? I'm not going to tell you how to set your coordinate system and stuff like that, which is already known to you. We're going to start with adding a 5-axis operation. <clears throat> so again here, we have got the strategies. Parallel cuts, parallel to curve, parallel to surface, parallel perpendicular to a curve. Morph between two curves, morph between two edges and surface and projection. Let's use parallel curve, parallel cuts. Or let's just use parallel to curve. Okay? Where we have the geometry. Now in the geometry, you have got two items. First of all, you need to select the surface that you're going to machine, and you need to select a driving entity. The driving entity could be a curve or it could be a surface, depending on what strategy you have used. So in this case, since we are saying parallel to curve, I would like to use curve as a driving entity. So my drive surface is actually going to be the surface. Okay. Now, another very important thing that you need to do when you're working in five axis, especially on parts that are imported from another system, is that you need to check the normals of the surface. The normals of the surface should always be pointing outward unless you want to trick this, the, so, the software to machine inside, okay? You can do that. Those tricks are available to us. But in general terms, the normal must be outside. So currently it is outside, so I don't need to do anything. Edge curve is the curve that's actually going to drive the tool. Now, suddenly you see that things are turning orange. Now, this is a new feature that we added. It's a new feature that we added. Right, it's a new feature that we added in SolidCam, wherein the moment I go to entity selection or the second entity selection, it tells me what was my previous entity that I selected. It could be black surfaces, which are in orange color, check surfaces, different color. So it will give me a, a visual interpretation of the entities that I have already selected. So my curve is going to be this curve. Okay, accept it. Then we come to a, another interesting part. And that's the area. You'll hear some aircrafts moving. There is some military exercise today. A lot of Sukhois are flying over our office. So pardon me for those noises. So the area basically asks us, how much of this entire surface do you would like to machine? Okay, there are two, three possibilities. So if I go into this view, I can say machine exactly from this edge onwards till you find no more cuts. Okay, that is start and end at exact edges. And then you have got full avoid at exact edges. That means I am not sure of how this edge is because it's an important part. I would not like to use or damage this edge. I want the tool to start inside that particular edge. Okay. 
So we're going to use star and n at the exact surface edges. There are other uh, uh, options. That means I don't want to define the area based on uh, uh, the start and end, but I would like to distribute and say I want 50 cuts on this, and the distance between the cut is going to be about two millimeters. So I can even determine that by cuts, or I can pick two points on the surface and say machine only between these two surfaces, or between these two points. Sorry. So I have both the start and end, and then I have the margins. Okay, we'll come to the margins a bit later. Let's pick the tool. And I have a six ball nose here. Like I said, strategies. Next is our tool axis control. Now, in tool axis control, the most commonly used tool axis control is tilted relative to the cutting direction. In, in our case, the cutting direction is coming from Z axis. So all my tilts actually will happen now from Z axis. Okay. So in when we say tilted relative to cutting direction, I need to specify two angles to solve it again. One is the lead lag and the other one is tilt. We're going to see this because this is how even I understood what these two angles are. Okay. So we're going to currently keep this at zero. This is my tool axis control. I don't want to do anything else. I just simply hit save and calculate. I would like to see the result. I will get some toolbar. I may like it. I may not like it. I have some toolbar. Okay. We will we will go into merits and demerits of this toolbar a bit later. Let's run the simulation to see exactly where it's starting from. That's my first cut. You can see what is happening. That's my z-axis, and it's starting from here. It's starting from underneath, which is starting from below. So we need to fix that particular problem. So the first problem that we have is it's starting from below. And why is it starting from below? Because if I go to my levels here, I have asked the software to start from a plane height of 60 millimeters from in z direction plus 60. So if I go to my first coordinate here, okay, you can see that my first coordinate is plus 60. But my first point is not at that particular point. My first point is below. So the tool is actually going to start from that and then go to its starting position, which is below. So this is wrong. To fix this, we need to first look at the shape of the part. The shape of the part is cylindrical. So it's common sense that when you have a cylindrical part, it's not a good idea to use a planar clearance area. You need to use a cylindrical clearance area. Okay? So let's fix this problem first. Where do you fix it? You fix it in the levels where you use the clearance area and when you say, I need to use a cylinder. Okay, now let's go and check what is the uh, diameter of the cylinder and that's like 100 millimeters the diameter. So I need 25 millimeters beyond the diameter. So I need to have 150 as the diameter of a imaginary cylinder to which all my retract motions are going to be pulled. So I will say I need 75 millimeter radius cylinder that is whose axis is passing through x axis. So it's passing through x axis. Now let's calculate and look at how my toolbar looks like. It's much better. You can see that I have got an imaginary circle of 150 diameter to which all my retracts are being pulled to. So if I now go into my simulation and go to the retract, you see that it's no longer going at the bottom and then coming back. You see that it's always going from the point, this point, on to the first point on the part. Okay, let's look at the first point on the part. 
Okay, let's zoom here and let's, let's go. Now, if you look, you really would, won't understand what's happening here. So the next question that arises here is, I do not want to start from here, but I would like to start from the other side. Okay, simple. I'm exactly telling you, in fact, uh, if I meet you guys in Germany in May, I will hand over to you an, a, a series of recording of my first five axis training that was done by whom I would call my guru. And this was exactly the part. And this is how people start understanding how things work inside five axis. Rather than just take an impeller and try to show a lot of things which people will not really understand anything. So, if, you're, if you think the part is pretty easy, just have patience because there are other people who probably will be looking at it for the first time. So I would like to start this cutting not from this side, but from this side. To do that, I need to go to toolpath parameters and into sorting, and I can flip the step over. That means instead of starting from, let's say, uh, x0, I would like to move it to x minus 150. That's probably that's the point. Let's hit the calculate button. OK, and let's go into the simulation for the first point. You can see what is happening now. It's taken the machining on this part. Now it's much more easier to comprehend. OK, so there is my uh, first part of first point. It's here. OK. Now, let's look at our x value, and it says x is minus 139.525. Now, let's check if this value is actually right, okay? So let's go into our CAM. I have this coordinate system, so I would like to measure, with reference to coordinate system, one, I would like to measure it. So this value is 139.55. Where is our tool coming now? Let's simulate. Our tool is coming to minus 139.525. So let's go to the calculator. 139.55 minus 139.525. Okay, we have a difference of approximately 25 microns. Okay, for 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 an for an engineer, machining parts. Generally, this won't sound uh, much of a problem. 25 microns, fine. But what is causing it? This is being controlled by another parameter, and that's what we call as a margin when we define our curve here. And this margin is roughly given us 30 microns. So the difference that you are looking at is that margin. Okay? Why is this difference? Why is this margin given? To understand why this margin is given, let's go into paint and let's look at a surface. Let's say I have the surface here. Okay? I have the surface which I have got as an important part from another system. Now, for me, this surface would look extremely beautiful, it looks fine, absolutely no problem. But when I send this for calculation, the software looks at the surface and let's say it tries to magnify this particular area. Now this magnific this area when magnified will look something like this. That is because when the soft when the part was imported into Solid Chem or into SolidWorks, you have actually used a trimming curve tolerance. And the trimming curve tolerance is the one that creates these edges like this. Okay. Now, if we set this value as zero, okay, and if the surface is very bad, okay, let's make it. It says you can't make it exactly zero, so let's make it 0 0.001. Okay. Two major zeros. Let's make it 0 0.001. If I make it too tight and if the surface is bad, okay, 
if the surface is pretty bad, then what is going to happen is it is going to get a cut here, and then it is not going to find any cut, and it will get in the next cut here, like this, and then it will come here, it will not find any cut, and it will get another cut here. So most of you who are wondering when you're trying to machine a surface, the first cut or the first tool bar on the edge of the surface, you see a lot of retracts coming. You can't figure out why it is happening. It's happening because of this phenomenon. It's happening because the surface that was imported inside a solid cam was not a perfect surface for machining. And that is why this margin is given here. Sometimes if the surface is very bad, you need to go as high as 0.1 to have the first cut come properly. Okay. But anyway, we need the default works fine because you can't really have really bad uh, surface imports coming from software. Although there is a great possibility, especially if the part was done completely in surfacing and then imported into SolidWorks. Okay, so that was that's about our margins and that's how my tool will start either inside or outside. Now, if I change it to full, avoid cut at exact edges and calculate, you'll see that the first pass actually is not exactly on the surface, but it comes inside the surface. And this value is equal it's equal to this value here. It's equal to the step over. It will be slightly, or sorry, half of the step over. So if my step over is one millimeter, I, it will be inside by 0.5 millimeter, okay? It will not cut the exact edge. It will not damage the edge. It will be machining inside the edge. Perfect, so we have first fixed how we are going to start, okay? So we start exactly at at the surface and and start exactly in the end at exactly the surface edges okay so we have fixed the first problem we did not want to machine the other side we would like to machine from this side now let's dwell a bit on our tool axis control so what is going to happen in tool axis control now if you look at the simulation of this particular part okay you will see that the exact tip is in contact with the part. We know that the exact tip is zero R not a great, uh, not a great idea to cut a part with the exact tip. The best would be to cut the part using the side of the tool. Okay, any one of the any point on the side of the tool. Now, in order for me to do that, I will have to tilt the tool. This tool has to be tilted either on this side or on this side. Okay? Now, here comes the definition of tilt angle. Any angle that is provided across the tool path. Okay? That is perpendicular to the tool path. So, in our case, okay, if I capture this image, take it into paint, So, in this case, if I tilt the tool onto this side or onto the side, because the tool path is in this way, it's tilting or the tool is rotating across the tool path. This is my tilt angle. Okay? So, let's apply the tilt angle and see how it works. Let's go to the tool axis control and you have the tilt angle here. You can apply both. You can have positive values. You can have negative values. Okay. So let's apply a nice tilt angle of 45 degrees and let's see how this function works. Now you remember I told you the slide here. The slide. I'll keep it constant, and that is the five-axis principle: contact point and the cutter location point. Very nice example of contact point and cutter location point. You can see that the cutter location point has gone out of the part. Okay? But let's see what is the contact here. Cutter location point to contact point. 
Okay? The tool contact point is now on the part, whereas the cutter location part already has gone out of the part. And that's why you see a completely different tool path out here. Okay? You see that the tool has the tool path has lifted up as if we are trying to machine using the uh, uh, center of the tool. But actually that is not happening because the, the center point has now gone up because the side of the tool is cutting. If I make it minus 45, it's going to be pretty obvious that it will tilt the other side and it will push the tool path inside in this direction. But that doesn't mean that the tool is actually going to start cutting from this point. It's actually going to start cutting exactly at the same point because the cutter location point is here and the cutter contact point is out here. Okay, there is another comment. Okay. We'll finish it another 10 minutes. Our first part, we're going to finish it pretty quickly. The next angle here, I'm going to change it now to zero. Calculate. <clears throat> the next part of the angle is to understand that we will have to look from this direction. Okay. The next part of the angle <clears throat> is also called as the lag angle or lead angle. Now, this angle is applied along the tool path, not across, but along. So, if I edit and apply a tool uh, lag or lead angle of, let's say, 30 degrees and calculate, this is how my tool path will look like. Okay, now you're seeing some mess here. This I'll explain why this happened. You can see the contact. It's no longer on the tip, but it is contact. The contact point here is the side of the tool. But if you go and look on another side from, let's say, from this side here, you will actually see that there's not much of a change because we have not applied any tilt. The angle will be visible only if you start looking from the side. Okay? Now, when you apply a lag angle, in some machines, what it basically does is it shifts the tool axis. If it was running at Y0, it will shift it to, a, let's say, Y20 or Y25, which means a lag angle is a great uh, feature when you would like to machine a part using a bullnose tool. Okay? You don't want to use the face of the bullnose tool, but you would like to use the side of the bullnose tool to work with, lag angle is the best possible feature that you could use to machine the bullnose tool. In the next webinar, I'm going to show you some parts where we apply the lag angle to create tool paths using the bullnose tool. Right, so I know this has been a pretty long webinar and I'm sure that we're going to continue this in, the, in a few other sessions. I expected this to be about three webinars, but I think we're going to have more than that because this is going to be not much in depth, but at least I need to explain to you functions from where you can actually take off independently and work with five axis. So in my next session, that is next Thursday, we are going to see some more functionalities of, of five axis, especially the strategy and some parts, and then we will move further into five axis. Sydney, so, uh, for this particular webinar, I am done. If there are questions related to what I've shown today, please uh, ask the audience to ask me. Okay, thank you very much, Ahmad. Uh, I see three short questions here, but I think two of them are you probably will be covering in the next webinars. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, uh, so that's it for now. Uh, those questions that were asked by Andre, uh, the, the, they will be covered in the next webinars as well. Uh, thank you very much again, Amod, for the webinar. Uh, and this webinar has, be re has been recorded as usual and will be available on the resellers section of, the, of, our, of our website. And uh, take care, everyone. Have a great weekend. And again, hopefully, we'll see whoever's at SolidWorks World next week at our booth. And don't forget again to register for the Salakam world in Germany in May. Take care and have a great weekend.